Hello and welcome to Peeling Sid Barrett. This will be episode 32 and in this episode I will discuss three songs that are I guess you could say roughly approximated to be love songs. One of them is named a love song, the other one is named Late Night, and the last one is named Love You. Now Love You is a little bit of a silly song, kind of a happy-go-lucky song, and the other two are a little bit more closely related I would say but uh, they all have something to do with the episode that I want to try to put together here. Now this is probably about the third time that I've tried to put together this episode and the reason for that is because I'm going to run through a number of complicated topics. Some of them are not easy to talk about and uh, it's also kind of hard to keep a, a uh, direct and linear frame of mind when I'm running around through all these topics without meandering too much and without pausing too much so I've resolved to kind of give this one more shot and see if I can get this done and hopefully it goes well so let's start off uh, we have a fairly big group of new subscribers so thank you if you have recently subscribed just a reminder if you want to make comments or ask questions please feel free to do so we have a number of good and knowledgeable people that are part of this series and they do regularly comment and uh, I've learned things from them and if you have questions or if you want to look through their discussions you can do so. Uh, I do think that having a community of people to kind of discuss these things and these songs, generally speaking the songs but not entirely songs, it's a very rewarding kind of an experience I guess and it does help to give me a little bit more energy to keep going with this and also I think it it enriches the experience for other people so if you have comments or questions you want to ask and it's constructive then please feel free to do so uh, <clears throat> now let's go ahead I guess and move on into our corrections where where we normally start and uh, there are a number and one of them is one I'm going to save for the very end of this it'll be a contextual element so that'll be our last correction but let's go ahead and, and run through the various corrections and clarifiers that I want to make before we head into our three songs now one of the comments that uh, was made by um, by a renewed poet was that there is a possibility of a, a baptismal reference in She Took a Long Cold Look at Me. So when I broke down that song in the previous episode, the last line of She Took a Long Cold Look at Me references uh, breathing as water streams over me. Now, uh, in this case, I, I felt that looking up into the skies, this could be a reference to tears, uh, streams of tears, but I do think uh, that Renewed Poet is quite quite correct. It could definitely be a reference to bap baptism. And the reason for that is because, as we have mentioned, Mr. Barrett does make a number of Christian references in his music, or just religious references, I guess you could say. He's constantly making religious references. But he does make quite a few Christian references. And in the song, It Is Obvious, we specifically pointed to the possibility that the discussion of the the uh, the brambles or the reason things are written on brambles and stranded on spikes and red blood will listen is quite quite possibly I would say there are enough there's almost four different references to religion there the brambles uh, spiked brambles which of course could be a thorn of crowns which is a, a Christ reference the reference to red blood also a Christ reference and finally the very beginning of it which is the reason it is written and the reason it is written of course could be a kind of a variation on the idea of something being written on the wall or plainly seen plainly understood and foreboding in a way or plainly stated now uh, the story of something being written on the wall I forget w what exactly the the uh, terms were that it in, in the native language 
and I can't remember if it was written if it was written in Hebrew or not, but uh, it, it very likely was, uh, is that something has been counted and found wanting, or in other words, it has been judged and found to be wanting, which is a form of guilt. So uh, we'll get into why that may be applicable here later on. I just want to point out for now that the Christ reference and the blood reference are there in, in that song. It is obvious. So certainly... Renewed Poet may be correct that the water streaming may be a reference to baptism, and perhaps even baptism through tears. Uh, another correction that I want to kind of make is I, I'm, I kind of discussed the, the mog to a gog kind of idea. And I can't remember what song that's from, but I'll kind of point that up, put that up here. Now, so one of the reasons that uh, this is kind of interesting is because I was thumbing through some things the other day, and in particular I was thumbing through Barrett, which is my um, Russell Beecher and Will Shoots album or uh, book, and this is by Essential Works Limited, 2011, and in particular I want to point you to a painting that was made by... Uh, Anthony Stern. Now, Anthony Stern is an individual that Mr. Barrett, when he was very young, put together an art show with, and the painting that Anthony Stern made is called On the Gogs, 1964, and uh, I may perhaps show a, a portion of it here. Now, why is, why is that important? Well, uh, because there are the Gog Magog Hills, so this 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 statement of Mog to a Gog may be a variation of the Gog Magog Hills. And, of course, the reference in it that in the same song, it is obvious the last two lines are Mog to a Grog, and there's a star of white chalk, and then having minds shot together. Now, the minds shot together could, of course, be a psychedelic reference. It could also be a love reference, so a deep form of love formed at the Mog, uh, at the Gog Magog Hills. Now, I will point out that the Gog Magog Hills are a range of low chalk hills around the Cambridge area. And in that song, uh, it is obvious there is a mention of white chalk right there. So, uh, Mog to a Gog may indeed be a reference to the Gog Magog Hills. Now, why Mog to a Gog is, is called out, I don't really know. I believe someone mentioned that it may be a a call out to the idea of things being done to a T or in detail. Uh, so it may be a combination of those two ideas, and, and that definitely is possible. If I can find that comment, I'll post it here. Uh, Mr. Barrett, of course, did like to combine ideas quite frequently. And that leads me to my last correction, I suppose, which is that... Um, Oh, one more thing. In Mr. Juan Palacios's book, uh, page 436, I believe, is what I call out, uh, he mentions that Mr. Barrett was working on a painting or an artwork of the, uh, of the Gog Magog Hills. So perhaps Mr. Barrett is ruminating on these very old memories, even later in his, in his old age, now, uh, towards the end of the book, of course, Mr. Palacios is discussing uh, the, the influences, possible influences, and, and works that Mr. Barrett is tackling in his older age. Again, this is uh, Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd Dark Globe by uh, Julian Palacios. Sorry, not Juan Palacios, Julian Palacios. And this is copyright in 2010. So, uh, there is a mention there of perhaps... There's now three examples of the Gog Magog Hills, and perhaps an item of interest specifically to Mr. Barrett. What that all means, I don't know. Now, why he would be fixating on those things, uh, perhaps, as we've mentioned, there's the idea of lost love. Uh, perhaps there is simply a recognition of the great beauty and the, and the personal connection to those places, which not everybody feels during the course of their life. Some people 
make a very strong connection to land, and some people don't. But perhaps Mr. Barrett did. And uh, due to the, to the various rural references in his music, you would have to think very likely he did. So uh, I just wanted to point out that Gog Magog kind of idea. Now, the last thing that I would like to mention is that, um, well, there's two more. I almost forgot one, so I don't want to forget one. I'll finish with that last one. So minimalist, the idea of minimalist poetry, which is, again, called out by the renewed poet. So he mentions that Mr. Barrett is a bit of a minimalist in, with, with his uh, writing, and I would have to agree. That's a, an excellent word. I can't think of a better word that describes Mr. Barrett. He has a tendency to take very large, big things, take a few excerpts from them that are very interesting, and then tie them together in a new way, which is absolutely wonderful. He does, in many ways, create a painting or a work of art with his words uh, by making references to personal stories and also uh, various forms of literature, and we'll get into that uh, later on as well. So uh, the last thing that I would kind of like to point out is that um, Jose Lamsfus mentioned that one of the possible connections to um, to dominoes or the feel of dominoes is captured in Yeats' poem The Tower, the third part in the last paragraph specifically, which calls out kind of the idea of past memories and losing friends. And I would agree that portion of it certainly does have a very similar kind of a, a languishing feel to it that ties in quite a bit with uh, the experience of, that may be expressed in a song like Domino's. So uh, I'll just read a little bit of it here and I'll put it up on the screen for you. This is uh, The Tower by W.B. Yeats. Last paragraph. Now shall I make my soul compelling it to study in a learned school till the wreck of body, slow decay of blood, tasty delirium, or dull decrepitude, or what worse evil come, the death of friends, or death of every brilliant eye that made a catch in the breath, seen but the clouds of the sky, when the horizon fades, or a bird's sleepy cry among the deepening shades. A very depressing kind of idea, but certainly captures this kind of idea of waiting and experiencing the death of friends, and perhaps even um, the destruction of self, or the loss of brilliance within oneself, which perhaps is being relayed in a song like Domino's. You'll have to decide that on your own. At any rate, uh, I would like to go ahead and move on. Now, before I move into our, our actual work elements, what I would like to discuss is our updated list. Now, if you're new, we have had some new people join. I, I will just remind you that on the side, on my own, I don't always post this, but I do keep track of the general themes of Mr. Barrett's music, and I and I make an accounting of that. And the point of that is, of course, to try to develop a fingerprint for his work. So I've updated that, and I will go run through that really quickly here. Uh, male, female inversion, I have eight cases of that. Sexual metaphor or innuendo, I have seven. The king, queen, royal reference, I have six. Young and animal metaphors, etc., I have 13. This uh, shy personality, dismissive, misogynistic, I have seven. Lost love and torn attraction, I now have 18. Changing religious or esoteric beliefs, I have eight. Alienation, separation, I have at eight. Uh, drug or psychedelic references, I have at 10. Colors or painting references, I have at 12. Uh, flying, dreaming references, sleep, travel, I have at 10. Hidden relations and sorrow, I have at 12. Uh, sun, stars, or planet references, I have at 8. Low, high art combinations, I have at 4. Uh, Joyce, Shakespeare, Tolkien style references, I have at 7. Extensive planning, I have at 2. Science, I have at 2. Abbreviations and nicknames, I have at 5. Let me change that one. I forgot to update that one. 5. Uh, other band references, I have at 4. Those would be like the Velvet Doors, Bob Dylan, and uh, Velvet Underground, The Doors, and Bob Dylan. 
and uh, childhood references I, I have at four presently. So that is the update for the general thumbprint and the more examples obviously that I can find I, I feel those are themes that he has a, a tendency to really develop. So let's go ahead then and uh, jump into our three work elements and those three work elements are Love Song, Late Night and Love You. I'm going to start with Love You and uh, the reason for that will be apparent here in just a minute. So uh, if, if I can find a lyric ver version I'll post it here. If I can't maybe you could pull up the lyrics on your phone, follow along with the lyrics as we go and consider them on your own. Uh, mention of Honey Loving You and Honey Little so who knows if this is a, a small person or not. Uh, now he goes ahead and jumps into some alliteration or clanging as we used to call it but now I realize was incorrect and just as an aside here I'll point out I did make some of what I would consider to be mistakes in my earlier episodes I'm constantly making mistakes that's part of the creative process and some of my word choices I think were were incorrect so the idea of clanging I think was quite incorrect what is happening is poetic alliteration so here he is using poetic alliteration honey funny sunny morning a wonderful combination and uh, very simple but I, I guess you could say kind of happy-go-lucky upbeat and it kind of makes you smile a little bit there's a lot of positivity in those words so he mentions a uh, loving you and funny love in the skyline so there's a reference to the skies and then he alliterates with ice cream and excuse me which uh, <laughs> has the S, K, and the M sound in both of those combinations of words, ice cream and excuse me. So why he has chosen to say excuse me, I don't know. But it certainly is alliteration. He mentions that whoever this was, whoever this is, is looking good the other, or he saw this person looking good the other evening. Uh, the next verse mentions that... Uh, Oh, you uh, you dig it. In other words, you're into it of some kind. So they're smiling for an hour or so, and then he asks, perhaps a rhetorical question, "Are we in love?" And he thinks, like he thinks that they could be. Now the next three lines are very important to me, and I'll explain why in a moment. He mentions it ain't a long rhyme. It took ages to think, and that's important to me because this rhyme could of course be a reference to the song itself and most likely is a reference to the song itself in which case what he is saying is that this isn't very long but it took him a very long to a long period of time to put this together in his head how long it's very difficult to know it's hard to know how long someone has been working on something in their head and putting together a song unless you're the person doing it uh, we know when it was written and released I'll put that information up here but we don't know when he was putting this together but it is obvious here that he says very specifically it took ages to think about it or it took a very long time to mentally organize it the next line is an important line and I'll explain why he says I think I'll hurl it in the water baby now that seems a little bit odd we've constantly come back to this idea of water and of course uh, James Joyce in I believe verse 35 mentions the waters running uh, below in chamber music and we've already noted that Mr. Barrett had knowledge of chamber music so the waters or and there are various references to water by Mr. Barrett including the song in a song like Terrapin but the, the idea of water and I will again point out if you haven't watched did Sid Barrett metal uh, that album is built on the idea of water and echoes and waves. So uh, why would he mention that he'll hurl it in the water? Well of course uh, uh, water is a very destructive and also a very important building material. So for poets it references in many ways their own subconscious. It's a, it's a place where and the temporariness of many things including time and, and the world itself. So uh, hurling something into the water could of course be a reference to the temporary nature of this song and that would be putting it into a form of reality 
Now there is, of course, something that this reminds me of, and that's Mr. Keats. Now Mr. Keats was one of the greatest uh, English poets, a romantic poet. <laughs> Not coincidentally, I would say, Mr. Barrett, you could say, is quite a romantic. So uh, Keats was born in 31 October 1795. He died in 23 February of 1821. He was only 25 years of age. He put together all of his poetry before the age of 25. So a very short life, certainly. And on his headstone is a, I believe, a quote that he requested be placed there. And I believe it says, here lies one whose name was writ in water. In other words, whose name and existence, therefore, were writ in water or were temporary. <clears throat> and perhaps, in many ways, uh, the idea of writing in water also captures the idea of writing from a subconscious, writing from a muse, uh, being an artist, and pulling things from that portion of our self that is very watery and is perhaps a... Uh, a reflection of the world or an echo of the world so um, why is this why is this interesting to me well not only of course is this a, a Keats reference and I'll get into this a little bit more but there are other indicators that uh, mr. Barrett may have been considering aspects of Keats and I'll get into those just a little bit here in a moment so let's keep going the, the next verse repeats and then he mentions that this person in the next original verse, he, he mentions that this person is flaking a little. Now flaking, I don't know about everywhere else, but in the US, flaking is kind of a, a slang term for someone that's not dependable and is a little bit goofy or uh, I don't know, not entirely tight, tightly put together kind of in the head of what they want to, what, what they want. They're indecisive and they are not really, I guess you could say, decisive. So he mentions that this person is going to put it all around. It's good. I like it. So this, of course, could be a sexual reference. In other words, this person is a free lover, a person that's into just kind of going around and being with other people. And the last line of that verse mentions whoopee and swing it along across to me. In other words, bring it on over here, whoopee, like yay. But I will also point out that whoopee is also, or making whoopee, is also another slang term for intercourse. Uh, the chorus repeats, and then we'll go to the next verse, which is that this person is a good time rocker woman. Again, uh, a possible intercourse reference that is, I would say, very thinly veiled. Uh, a mention of straying or pieces, what that could mean, I don't know. It could, of course, mean straying, straying from who they're already with. This could be a reference to having an affair of some kind outside of whoever your steady boyfriend or girlfriend is. And I mentioned that they're a little bit creepy and shine sleepy, so, uh, so whoopee, and then that's how you look. Now, <laughs> That, that particular, now if you actually listen to the song, it just cuts off and it doesn't finish, which is incredibly odd, but in, in many ways, to me anyway, it's charming. It doesn't finish the idea that is started within this, within this particular verse. Why? I don't know. Perhaps we're meant to understand what the ending of it might be. So uh, before we move on to the other two songs, I would like to move on to uh, two contextual elements, and I would like to give some background for a few things. Now, uh, the first is, uh, should I do that now, or should I just go ahead and jump into the other two songs? I guess, I guess I feel like just doing the other ones now, so. Uh, there is a a video which includes an interview with Dougie Fields and and Dougie Fields if you're not aware of who Dougie Fields was he's a painter and he uh, lived with Mr. Barrett for quite some time and that time period included before and after Mr. Barrett had been with the band there is an, an interview I'll link it I'll give you the information you can watch it and from minutes say 4 to minutes 10 or 4 to minutes 11 he kind of discusses his impressions of Mr. Barrett 
and he makes a number of very interesting statements and I'll just kind of clue you into them. You can watch it. Feel free to watch it if you want. Uh, watch minutes 4 through 11 and then come back and start up here again. Or you can just listen to this and you can go back and verify it on your own if you want. Okay? I'll leave that up to you. So the first thing that's interesting to me that Mr. Dougie Fields says, and of course Mr. Fields was living with Mr. Barrett after he had left the group or had been pushed out of the group depending upon your point of view. In this interview, Mr. Dougie Fields specifically says Sid Barrett left the group. He says it very nonchalantly. He knew Sid Barrett after Sid Barrett had fallen out with Pink Floyd, and he specifically says that Sid Barrett left the group. In other words, it it may have been here's here's your here's your argument if you're of that mindset that Mr. Barrett left. He says it very specifically there that Barrett left the group. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing that I would like to point out is that Dougie specifically mentions that he didn't notice any forms of odd behavior in Mr. Barrett right away. Uh, and this is, of course, after he had been pushed out of the group for odd behavior. So why is it that someone that is living with Mr. Barrett and interacting with him quite a bit is not calling out odd behavior immediately? And you have to start to wonder then at some point in time, since this is now kind of two cases, and eventually Mr. Field says, yeah, he did eventually start behaving oddly, and perhaps they, they moved on from one another and were no longer living together, etc. Of course, they were at some point in time no longer living together. But you have to begin to wonder if this isn't a behavior of Mr. Barrett. In other words, uh, with the band and with Dougie, with other people even, is he being charming because he wants to be charming? And is he being irritating because he wants to be irritating? And is he kind of checking out on people because he wants to check out on people? So there is an example kind of of Mr. Barrett doing some certain things like this. And I'll just kind of point to a few things. Now in Mr. Palacios's book in page 426, uh, Rosemary specifically says that Mr. Barrett would still make songs and play, but whenever anyone came into the room, he would stop playing. Now, you can argue that that is for various reasons. She kind of states something along the lines of, if I recall correctly, he didn't really want people to comment on what he was playing, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, she knew him quite well, so... That's definitely possible. I would like to also point out that there are more than one possibility there. It is possible, of course, that he was stopping playing because that was his habit. And that habit may, be, may have been formed from things like people stealing music from him. Not to imply that Rosemary would do that, but it may have just been a habit at that point in time. Another reason may be because he's deliberately hiding the music he's making because he doesn't want people to be able to make the connection to him with the songs that he's writing. Now, in our other series, we're doing Did Sid, and if you're of that mindset that Mr. Barrett was perhaps working with other musicians, then this would perhaps be a reason why. Perhaps he wasn't, exp he was uh, um, trying to avoid connections with musicians. Perhaps he didn't want people thinking that he was still part of that environment because they had a negative opinion of that environment. Definitely, definitely possible. Now, the third thing that I would like to point out for Mr. Dougie Field's interview is, uh, oh, and one more thing. On page 427 of that same book, Mr. Palacios's book, uh, Jenny Lindemore Gordon specifically says that she does not believe that Mr. Barrett was uh, affected with schizophrenia, that he perhaps acted or behaved oddly at times, but he, she does not believe that he was affected with schizophrenia, in her opinion. Now, the uh, third thing is that Mr. Dougie Fields mentions that Mr. Barrett started out working on things, but then he would become quite lazy and do nothing. And I will point you back again to Miss Rosemary's statement that when he was creating music and people came by, he would deliberately not do it anymore. So it is specifically possible that he is hiding his creativity from other people and why he would choose to do that is he choosing to do that with art is he choosing to do that with painting is he choosing to do that with music is he choosing to do that with everything 
and why. And that hidden kind of nature within Mr. Barrett could be an identifier of a drive to perhaps continue working, which we know he continued painting throughout the entire course of his life. And he continued to create art and be driven to do so that he may have had much bigger ideas than, than, than people actually recognize. So uh, that's pretty much it for what I would like to discuss with Mr. Dougie Fields. I just want to point out that depending upon who the person is that's interacting with Mr. Barrett, I would like you to realize that their takeaways from him and his behavior can be vastly different. And those often are influenced by how Mr. Barrett is choosing to behave around them. Now, uh, we did mention two Keats poems, and I will read those two Keats poems to you really quickly, and I'll put them on the, on the um, screen here as I read through them. The first is, When I have fears that I may cease to be. Now, uh, there are a number of songs by uh, Pink Floyd and by Mr. Barrett, which appear to be kind of tugging at the idea of fear of death. Okay? And it is interesting that these two poems, Bright Star and When I Have Fears, which are called out... Um, geez, where are these two poems called out? I'll, I'll put it up here. I'll put it... I'll put it on the screen when I, when I suppose I get to it. Uh, oh, here we go. It's on Mr. Rob Chapman's book, Very Regular Head, page 401. He mentions that when I have fears in Bright Star are handwritten notes in some of Mr. Barrett's um, books. Which is interesting because on page 437 of Mr. Palacios's book, he specifically mentions that there was no wind in the willows or poetry books around Mr. Barrett uh, in his possession after he had passed. So um, again, you can have vastly different kind of recollections of what influences might be on Mr. Barrett. But certainly, if he has a handwritten notes, as Mr. Chapman has noted, then he's considering these things to the end of his time. And, of course, these two poems are not difficult poems to remember succinctly in theme. So let's run through them really quickly. I'll do, I'll do When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be first. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my, my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high-piled books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone, and I think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. There are so many correlations to Mr. Barrett within this poem, it's difficult to point them all out, but I will attempt to do so very quickly. The first is an apparent fear of death. Now, I want to point out, of course, Mr. Barrett's father died of cancer when he was young, but notice the second sentence, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. In other words, the fear of death is not death itself, but the fear of passing before something has been accomplished. That accomplishment is, of course, the pulling together of something within this person's brain, or perhaps a great project, or a series of great projects, or simply the nature of creativity itself. Um, there, is a there is a mention of, in the fourth line, full ripened grain. In other words, uh, grain does ripen, it has to be dried, so that takes time. And of course, you want a project to actually attain its full value, which can take quite a bit of time. A mention of looking upon the night's starred face, so there is another starry reference. Why would someone look at the stars? Of course, romantic poets often made promises by the stars because of the permanent nature of stars, which is in contrast, of course, to the nature of planets, which are wandering and move constantly through the skies. There's a mention of a cloudy symbols of high romance. So here we have a romance uh, reference and uh, an attempt to trace the shadows of romance uh, with the magic hand of chance. 
Uh, the last, the second portion of the poem is perhaps captured in quite a bit of Mr. Barrett's songs, the idea of being together with a fair creature and no longer being able to see them or spend time with them in the same way at the same time, with the passing of time, that it makes this person stand alone on the shore. There are many references to the shore and, of course, to water. Uh, or temporary and impermanence of life and existence by Mr. Barrett, and to feel love and fame sink to nothing. Quite a wonderful idea that is tied up in that poem. Many correlations, of course, possible to uh, Mr. Barrett. The other poem is Bright Star, and uh, I don't believe that's the actual name of the poem, but that's the common name that it's known by. So. Let's run through that really quick and we'll see correlations to Mr. Barrett again. Now all these of course are written by John Keats. We just mentioned the fact that John Keats um, had the idea of his name being written in water. So here we go. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task a pure ablution round earth's human shores or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors no yet still steadfast still unchangeable pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast to fill forever its soft fallen swell awake forever in a sweet unrest still still to hear the tender taken breath and so live ever or else swoon to death. So there are a number of things there that I'll just kind of point out really quick that are again correlations to Mr. Barrett. First, the idea of a, of a bright star and that being tied to the idea of being steadfast or forever. Uh, now the bright star is called out of course in a, in a song like Terrapin and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> mentioned that it is hung aloft in the night and watching forever so the eternal nature of the stars of course seeing everything and watching the waters churn upon the earth and of course a mention of the mountains and the moors and we've we've discussed the path through the mountains which is constantly being referenced within the moon tarot card and also is stated within numerous Pink Floyd and Sid Barrett songs the second line of the second verse mentions being pillowed upon a fair love's ripening breast and that is interesting to me of course because there is an important song on the metal album called a pillow of winds and that is significant uh, we'll get into that a little bit more but i just want to point out that that reference to being pillowed upon the fair love's ripening breast is stated here and feeling a forever perhaps a, a sense of sweet unrest or unease and live forever or else swing to death in other words be caught forever in that moment of being I guess you could say kind of at the pinnacle of life the being eternally focused on that very romantic period of a time in a person's life that very special period of time in a person's life when they are young and in love and experiencing the eternal the eternity of that sensation that all seems to be called out there in that and that is I guess you could say um, very common to romance poetry so <clears throat> let's go ahead then and get back <laughs> we kind of uh, strayed a little bit there to Mr. Keats as contextual elements now let's get back to the last two songs that I wanted to discuss those being uh, Love Song and Late Night. So let's look at Love Song. It's a slightly easier one because it's not very long. It is a very specific song uh, in that it's relaying very concise ideas and it's doing so uh, and repeating it twice for some reason. Okay, so there's a mention that in the very first, again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a lyric version if I can. If not, then you'll have to pull up Love Song by Sid Barrett on your phone and look at the lyrics. He mentions that he knew a girl and he still likes her. Now, notice the word choice there is like, now, not love. Uh, 
there's a mention that she said that she knew she could trust him and I her will. Now that I her will can confuse quite a few people, but since we were just discussing in the previous line the nature that she would trust him, he's saying I her will. In other words, I also will trust her. So there's a statement there that he says, okay, baby. Now there's the reference again to the idea of baby, which is a slang term for okay uh, to, a, to a romantic partner of some kind. Uh, tell me what you be. In other words, tell me what you are. What could that possibly mean? What could that possibly be? Tell me what you be. And then he says he'll lay his head down and see what he sees. In other words, he'll think on it, perhaps sleep on it. Perhaps uh, this is a drug reference, it's hard to say. He mentions that when she came back, she had very open eyes. Why would her eyes be open? There's a statement here, I knew I was in for a big surprise. So in other words, she also perhaps is surprised. What could they be surprised about? Well, they could be surprised about what she be, which is the fourth line of the song. Well, what could she be that would be a surprise? Something that is unknown or perhaps a change of some kind. Uh, this, of course, could be a reference to something like a pregnancy. Uh, I don't know that that's what's happening there, but I just want to point out that that is something that is changeable, and it is something that could cause quite a bit of surprise, and it is also something that could change someone so that they are no longer what they were before. In other words, tell me what you be, and then we'll try and figure out what we're going to do. Uh, that's one possible reading. Other possible readings? I, I don't know. You'll have to decide on your own. I just want to point out that that's a possibility. So uh, let's look at late night then and run through that really quickly. Um, yeah, let's run through that really quickly. I just want to point out the that the... Now nah, I'm going to move on to another contextual element really quickly. Now this contextual element is the Beatles by Bob Spitz and this is uh, Little Brown and Company, New York, Boston, uh, copyright 2005 by Bob Spitz. Now on page, um, let's see what page is this, on page 314 is a retelling of the story and I won't get into it too much of the time that when the Beatles were finally starting to break through, they had been to Germany and done a number of things, that uh, Cynthia, or Cindy Lennon, who Mr. Lennon eventually married, of course, discusses the history of her informing Mr. Lennon that she was pregnant and was pregnant by him, and his reaction to it, which was not positive. Which is understandable, of course, for, for those guys. They're trying to break through in the music scene. They were just on the cusp of breaking through. And of course, uh, getting married and becoming a family man was not something that was probably in Mr. Lennon's mind at that point in time. So perhaps he was a bit resentful. Uh, I just want to throw that in there as, as a contextual element for perhaps if there was something similar happening with Mr. Barrett, which certainly is possible, there are enough uh, sexual references and innuendo in his songs to assume that he was uh, involved in relationships and perhaps there may have been some form of pregnancy. So uh, let's go ahead and move on and discuss the last song, Late Night. And of course Mr. Barrett's um, response to that, specifically if he felt that he had a creative process that he needed to undergo, that he needed to do these things, and that uh, becoming a family man may have gotten in his way, his reaction may also have been negative at that point in time. Hard to know. Okay, so let's discuss Late Night, the last song, work element that, we'll, that I'll discuss here, uh, generally speaking anyway. Uh, <clears throat> again, I'll provide a lyric video if I can. He says, when he woke up today and someone wasn't there to play and he wanted to be with them, and they showed their eyes and whispered love at the skies. Again, whispering love at the skies is something you do to pronounce eternal love. And he says that he wanted to stay with them. <clears throat> he mentions feeling alone and unreal in the chorus. And that he will always remember the way that this person kisses. It's a very special thing to him. 
Uh, the next the next verse says, when he lays still at night and he sees stars high in light. There again is a star reference of the eternal sensation of love, and he wants to be with them. Uh, the implication, of course, <clears throat> pardon me, is that he can't be with them, but he wants to be. He mentions being on the rooftops, and the rooftops are shining dark. He saw a spark and a spark of love that he wanted to stay with you. So that spark reference is of course consistent with stars that are sparks and can be references to sparks of love. The chorus then repeats and he gets to the next verse which is a mention of a name and a mention of a chain. So turning around on a chain. So perhaps they're still connected via some form of chain. Uh, <clears throat> but of course uh, I will point out that a chain or a ring a ring on a finger is a link of a chain, so this could of course be a reference to a form of a wedding or a concept of a wedding or perhaps the concept simply of being tied to someone. Um, that's certainly possible. He mentions that the sky is open uh, for that person. They grew tall and then he saw them small and he wanted to stay with them. So those last three um, lines are very important to me and I'll explain why. When we grew very tall is a mention, of course, of growing. In other words, this is someone that he probably knew when he was young and they were smaller. The next line is that he saw someone small. In other words, he has grown beyond them, which you would expect to possibly be a statement of him growing into some greater person, uh, which he was as a singer for a band like Pink Floyd. And then the final statement, I wanted to stay with you. In other words, uh, that will, the fame and the other things uh, to nothingness do sink. And perhaps for Mr. Barrett, that also is true. And that he realized that he wanted to stay with this person, even though it meant uh, leaving other things behind. Now, <clears throat> this, all this eternal kind of, this eternal kind of uh, dedication is consistent in many ways with the idea of a star. Now, I will uh, show you the tarot for the star here, and I will discuss the meanings of the star. According to the tarot, or this is the Rider Waite tarot deck, the star means left, loss, theft, privation, abandonment. Although another reading suggests hope and bright prospects in the future. So it's both of those things. And of course, stars are not always in the sky. Sometimes they do fall, so a falling star. If it is reversed, it can represent arrogance, impotence, and haughtiness, or arrogance and uh, impotence. So uh, quite a few things there that don't appear on the surface to be related, but um, perhaps by reference, they, they are important to Mr. Barrett. So this concept of being abandoned is consistent with his uh, a lot of his uh, solo music. Um, and of course, the calling out to the star as being a, a kind of a hope and bright prospects, but also on a romantic level, the eternal nature of the stars is called out in a song like Terrapin. And uh, there's a star above a person that's crystal blue. So um, we've run through quite a bit here. And uh, what I want to end with is... I want to, as a context element, I want to pick up on something that I missed earlier on. And this is the mistake I was alluding to earlier. And uh, it's, I guess you could say, a little bit embarrassing. Now, I will clarify that my background is science. Um, when I went to college, I tested out of English. And I was allowed to take one English class, which could be an advanced class. Uh, and so I took Shakespeare because I very much enjoyed Shakespeare. Now... <clears throat> The reason this is kind of embarrassing is because we've discussed jug band blues and we've discussed the idea of doing love in the winter. We've done that on numerous occasions. And uh, I had never read Winter's Tale. And just recently, for some reason, I was thumbing through uh, my, Shakes my Shakespeare book and I came across Winter's Tale and I said, aha, <laughs> maybe there's something there. You know, maybe that was kind of an aha moment. Maybe there is a reference to loving in the winter in this story that is consistent with other people's discussions of loving in the winter 
In other words, perhaps Kerouac and other people that we've cited already are also pointing to this idea of love in the winter. And perhaps that's tied within a Shakespearean reference, which makes sense to some degree. So, um, and you can go back and watch my discussion on uh, the Subterraneans by Jack Kerouac if you so desire. There are so many references in there that are consistent with Mr. Barrett's behavior, including the idea of just kind of staring at people <clears throat> to unnerve them that is specifically cited within uh, Subterraneans by Jack Kerouac. So uh, here's a basic rundown of The Winter's Tale by Shakespeare. Now there, there is a king and a queen. Again, there's a king and a queen reference. Uh, the king's name is Leontes and the queen's name is Hermione. And the king and the queen have a son together and his name is Mamilius. And during the course of a friend's visit, a friend of the king, who is also a king, by the way, uh, who comes to visit, and the queen's interaction with that friend, the king himself, Leontes, becomes insanely jealous, or he's basically driven insane with jealousy. And he begins to do a number of, I guess you could say, uh, deficient, mentally deficient things or uh, unwise things, certainly. And one of them is accuse his wife of infidelity with this other man. And even he even goes as far as to question the legitimacy of his own children or his own child. And eventually imprisons the queen. She gives birth to a daughter and the king also declares that the daughter is not his. <clears throat> he then sends uh, two of his lords to uh, confer with the oracle at Delphi. That is an interesting statement because, of course, the Oracle at Delphi is associated with Apollo. And as we have already mentioned, Apollo is tied to the swan. And, and uh, that reference was called out in the song Pillow of Winds. So there again is that use of a pillow. And it is tied within that song Pillow of Winds. You can go and watch uh, Did Sid Barrett Metal if you so choose. And I, I will just really quickly kind of relay that I did do a song very early on for Bright Star and When I Have Fears. They're pretty rough songs, but they have the lyrics, so if you want to check them out, you can. I'm not going to redo them because uh, they're bad, and <laughs> I did them kind of early on as I was, uh, and I still am, kind of messing with guitar. So uh, in some ways they're good, in some ways they're bad, but they essentially are what they are, and you can check those out if you want. They're on my channel. So, And part of the reason I use those or made songs of those is because I've always been drawn to those poems, but also because I saw that they were referenced within uh, Mr. Chapman's book for Mr. Barrett. And I knew that eventually I would be discussing those two very poems. So I made songs for them. Okay. <clears throat> so at any rate... The Oracle of Delphi is consulted and it comes back that um, the Oracle states that the king is behaving like an idiot and he's told this to his face uh, with a written <laughs> with a written note from the Oracle of Delphi, which is funny to me because uh, uh, I don't know, perhaps they did that. It seems a little bit, my understanding is that there were women that were uh, speaking in certain ways uh, at the oracle and then perhaps what they said was translated so that it could be understood in some way to the people that were visiting and requesting guidance at any rate the idea that it's written down there i guess perhaps it's written by the priests i don't know that are expected to translate so uh and that basically says that the queen is uh, blemishless without blemish the king is behaving like an idiot um, his own servants are loyal uh, his friend, the other king, is also a blameless, etc. And even then, the king denies or wants to deny what is happening. And at that point in time, he 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 is, uh, I believe, around then he is presented with a daughter that he denies is his own, and has sent away to be exposed. Perhaps that was earlier on, actually. And he is notified that the queen has died, or something along those lines. So it appears that this king has lost everything. Now, later, um, because the 
because the queen has been imprisoned, the son takes it badly, and uh, he, he dies somehow for some reason. It's hard to know exactly why. The implication is, of course, that the king is responsible for the, for the death of his own son, and that perhaps uh, the son has committed suicide or something along those lines. And uh, perhaps it's because of his own guilt that induces, I don't know, some form of state of malaise within the child, so the child passes. And uh, eventually, the king is, is, is proven sufficiently after a period of, uh, after a period of, I guess you could say, lamentation, he is proved to his daughter. His daughter is revealed to him as is his wife, and he realizes the error of his ways, and there is a happy ending of sorts for all of them. So that is the general plot of, of that story, and I would just like to point out, of course, that we have already discussed the possibility of of a son, perhaps, or a child that was lost in, this, in the artwork or the painting of uh, Little Red Rooster. And of course, we can assume that it's male because of the use of the word rooster and not chicken. And also the coloration of the, the uh, painting itself, which is quite reminiscent in texture to perhaps blood. So there may have been a loss of a child of some kind that's denoted in that painting. I won't say that I know that that's true, but it certainly is possible, okay? Now, if red is tied by Mr. Barrett, then there must also, uh, to male, which seems to be what he does, because he also consistently references uh, things to him in forms of red. So rosy, pink, uh, a scarlet, red, all of these various forms of red, he are, are very often self-references. So he appears to be uh, connecting the color red to male. So then we would similarly think that the idea of female would be contrary to that, which would either be blue or perhaps green. Those are contrasting colors. In a painter's world, the contrasting color to red is, of course, green. Uh, symbolically, it could also be blue, though. So I'll, I'll leave that open for now. And what I would like to do is, is go ahead and jump through some of the uh, notes I have on Winter's Tale, and we'll discuss those really quickly, and then we'll see kind of uh, if there's anything noteworthy in here that's, that's, that's worth talking about. Now, in Act 1, Scene 2, the very beginning of it, his friend uh, Polixenes mentions that nine changes of the watery star hath been the shepherd's note since we have left our throne. So there's a reference to a watery star. What the watery star could be, I don't know. But it is an interesting combination of words, and it is, of course, a note to the idea of the waters and the stars. Um, uh, now, within this same act and scene is when the queen is entreating the king's friend to stay, that the king is struck with jealousy. And I'll read that to you very quickly. Leontes, as an aside, says, Too hot, too hot to mingle friendship. Far is mingling bloods. I have tremor cordis on me. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may a free face put on, derive a liberty from hardiness, from bounty, fertile bosom. There is a mention there of fertility. And well become the agent, to may I grant, but to be paddling palms and pitching fingers, as now they are, and making practice smiles as in a looking glass, and then to sigh as for the mort of the deer. Oh, that is entertainment my bosom likes not, nor my brow. Amelius, art thou my boy? So there immediately is a reference to not only his insane jealousy in seeing his own wife simply holding hands with another man and entreating him to stay, but also he immediately questions the legitimacy of his own son for some reason. <clears throat> Again, there is the idea of the illegitimate or the legitimacy of a son being questioned. So let's go ahead and move on.
and you'll have to excuse me as I'm kind of thumbing through these trying to remember uh, um, what exactly is I have marked that's really important that I want to make sure I run through. Now in Act 2, what scene is this? I believe this is Act 2, scene 1, line 180. The king himself states that he has sent uh, yet for a greater confirmation for in an act of this importance were most piteous to be wild. I have dispatched in post to sacred Delphos to Apollo's temple, Cleomenes and Dion, whom you know. So he specifically mentions that he is sent off to the oracle at Delphi for some kind of guidance in this matter. Uh, <clears throat> page, uh, I'll say, um, Act 2, Scene 3, Line 200. The two lords are kind of discussing their travel to the oracle. Uh, they mentioned the great Apollo suddenly will have the truth of this appear. Oh no, that's that's sorry. I'm sorry. This is the king. He mentions 23 days they have been absent. His good speed foretells the great Apollo suddenly will have the truth of this appear. So again, he's stating his trust in the oracle at Delphi. <clears throat> now Cleomenes and Dion are at the oracle, and Cleomenes. This is uh, Act Three, Scene One, Line say eight, seven or eight. But of all the burst and the ear-deafening voice of the oracle, kin to Jove, so there's a reference to Jupiter, Jove's thunder, so surprised my sense that I was nothing. So they're discussing their experience at the oracle and coming back now. Um, let's see, Act 3, Scene 2, line 100. This is Hermione, who is discussing her own um, existence, I guess you could say. She's been, she's been placed in prison. She says, my third comfort starred most unluckily, so there again is a reference to unlucky stars, is from my breast, the innocent milk in it, most innocent mouth. So <clears throat> there's a reference to mother's milk. And of course, I just want to point out, uh, we did, did Sid Barrett, Adam Hart mother. And one of the questions I had was, you know, is this influenced by Sid Barrett in some way? Is this referencing a mother? His own mother, of course, was referenced perhaps in a song like Matilda Mother. But I will point out that it is possible that Adam Hart Mother is simply a reference to a mother, some mother, not necessarily his mother, but perhaps another mother, perhaps a mother of a child that has a small heart, or perhaps there's a form of a break with. One of the songs is titled something like Breast Milky or something like that. What could be meant by that? Well, here is a reference in Winter's Tale to the idea of milk being innocent, tied to the innocence of youth, and of course, the great sacrifice of um, the mother in producing a life-giving uh, liquid to their own child. <clears throat> now, uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit to an interesting bit from A Lord's Wife. This is, let me see, Act 3, Scene 2, Line 180. Her name is Paulina, I believe, and she is kind of a voice of reason. And she is one of the few people that can kind of talk to the king. I guess you could say she's not his equal, and she does uh, apologize from time to time. But she also is quite abrasive in her talk because he has deeply offended her lady, Hermione, which is the queen. So um, she mentions thy tyranny together working with thy jealousies, fancies too weak for boys, too green and idle for girls of nine. So there he's, she specifically mentions the nature of, of a, this king behaving like not only an imbecile, but also um, beyond what would be even rational for a green and idle girl of nine. So there is a connection of a color that ties in with with the feminine, which is green, which we would expect. Whether Mr. Barrett continues that connection or not, I don't know. Now, uh, the next thing I would like to relay is that, let's see, what is this? Act three, scene two, I believe, no, act three, scene three, there is a clown that enters at line 80. And 
the interesting part of that is that they define clown as a rustic. And of course, Mr. Barrett references clowns quite frequently in his songs. He has clowns and jugglers, and he also calls out a clown um, in another song. So what does he mean by clown? Well, here he's he could mean simply simple people, rural people, rustic people. And that is how Shakespeare is referencing them. So that may be why Mr. Barrett is referencing them in that way. There is in that same... Um, let's see, Act 3, Scene 3, I'm going to call out line, geez, I don't know, around line 60, a shepherd enters and he finds the baby girl who has been left to be exposed, and this is how he starts out his talk. I would there were no age between, between 10 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child wronging the ancient tree, stealing, fighting, and then horns horns blow. So right there, he is specifically calling out the difficulties of a period of time between when a, when a person is settled in adult life and when they are a child. That break in adolescence, that adolescent period, which he has just defined as be between the ages of around 10 and 23. And all of the difficulties that are tied with it which include what he calls wronging the ancient tree, getting wenches with child, stealing and fighting. And of course, stealing and fighting could of course all be tied to the idea of that same interaction of, of life, which is um, tied to the idea of um, youth and youthful love and romance and getting women with child and then forming permanent bonds that last for a lifetime. <clears throat> the next thing I'll call out is scene three. So this is act four, scene three, the very beginning. Autolycus, I believe is how you pronounce his name. He's singing. He sings, when daffodils begin to peer with high the doxy over the dale. Why then comes in the sweet of the year for the red blood reigns in the winter's pale. So there are many words right there, including we just discussed the use of the word pale in a song like uh, Proko Haram's uh, Wider Shade of Pale. There's a reference to red blood reigning, reigning. In other words, king and queen reference, a royal reference tied to blood, which we've discussed before, and a uh, mention of the winter and the winter's pale. Uh, the next thing that I'll call out is the use of the word compter, which is interesting to me because, of course, it looks a lot like computer. So this is uh, a clown enters interesting uh, as we mentioned the the clown of course could be a reference to rustics this is act four scene three line 36 i cannot do it without compters and if you check the notes a compter is a counter of metal discs used in calculating at any rate i just wonder if compter isn't like what we got the word computer from <laughs> just kind of an aside thought i suppose but one that's somewhat interesting to me. Now the last thing I'll pull from Winter's Tale is this beginning of Act 5, Scene 1, which is an important one, and I'll explain why. So uh, Cleomenes, who is one of the lords that stayed with Leontes, the guilty king, the king that now re realizes that he was wrong and has been serving penance. So this is their conversation. Cleomenes says, Sir, you have done enough and have performed a saint-like sorrow. No fault could you make which you have not redeemed, indeed paid down more, pen more penitence than done trespass. At the last, do as the heavens have done, forget your evil with them, forgive yourself. Leontes replies, well, Willest I remember her and her virtues, I cannot forget my blemishes in them, and so still think of the wrong I did myself, which was so much that airless it hath made my kingdom, and destroyed the sweet companion that ever man bred his hopes out of. So in other words, he's lamenting the loss of his queen and also the destruction or loss of his own son, all of which was caused by his own guilt and has been paying penance. What is his penance? Well, he's been spending his time grieving alone and uh, out of sight and perhaps has become a bit of a recluse. Uh, interesting, isn't it? So 
there we have perhaps a statement that ties in with Mr. Barrett's um, state of mind, if this is something that is happening. Did he tie his own guilt to perhaps a failed relationship? Was there a lost child of some sort? Did he feel that in serving penance perhaps uh, he was performing a duty or that there was a call for it to be done? Was he hoping to salvage other things in performing that or was he perhaps just trying to make right and what he may have considered to be his own poor actions and um, I guess you could say unwise decisions in life, um, which would include, of course, perhaps putting his own great ideas and work ahead of relationships, which is understandable, I, I would say, but still can cause a great deal of grief and guilt in a person if they realize that they have lost other things that are of very high value because they have chosen something like a career over relationships. And I will again point you to our Peeling Sid Barrett breakdown of Apples and Oranges, where we specifically mention the U.S. trip, which appears to have been a breaking point of some kind with Mr. Barrett, and perhaps was a recognition that something had gone wrong in a relationship. Okay, so the last thing that I want to point out, which was kind of another aha moment, and I've already addressed this topic. When, <clears throat> when I consider the nature of a painting like Red Rooster, and if there is perhaps a lost child, and a daughter, as we mentioned, which is in Dolly Rocker, the mention of a daughter, the mention um, within Dolly Rocker, and also um, within Scream Thy Last Scream, and there was one other song, that there may indeed be a painting for a daughter. Uh, that would be that would be logical, wouldn't it? But I was not um, able to locate one, and we would assume that that painting would be in green. Perhaps blue, but certainly one of those two colors, blue or green. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a painting that seemed to be indicating that. And I would think also that it would have a title. Uh, although, I guess it could be hidden. So, I couldn't find one, but I did have kind of an aha moment when I thought to myself, there is already a painting that ties in with femininity and also with being tied to the world forever. And that is, as we have mentioned, in the painting of a tortoise or a terrapin. And that is called out in um, the song Terrapin, which we've broken down already. And, of course, part of the questions I had for that song were, why is this song apparently relaying the idea of permanence tied to the world and femininity. If this is a song about love, you could assume perhaps that it is a romantic song, and for that reason, it's trying to convey that. But I will point out the possibility here that I realized or came to last night, which is that Terrapin could indeed be a song that is written for a daughter. The song was written later. Uh, the painting, I believe, was made in 1964. It's an etching, I believe. And perhaps he is tying the idea of the painting or the etching itself with a song, a new song that was perhaps made for a daughter. Thus, the first lines, which are deliberately ambiguous, loving you and I mean you, there's a star above this person that is crystal blue, crystal blue or true blue. And um, he says, oh baby, my hair's on end about you or I'm very excited about you. The next uh, verse mentions, I wouldn't see you and I love to. So perhaps he is unable to see this person and he would really love to. The rest of the song has this kind of a daydreamy feel to it. The idea of bumping noses now perhaps makes more sense because that is something many parents do with their children. They like to bump noses with their children. So I don't know that that's what's going on, but I will point out that perhaps that is what is happening in that song. And I would then point out that it is possible that Mr. Barrett was entering self-exile and perhaps had gone through this entire process because of guilt or perhaps perceived guilt or self-blame that was tied with failure in uh, personal relationships of some sort. At any rate, that's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to run through. I hope this uh, was interesting. For folks, again, please make comments, ask questions. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. I do try to put out stuff as I 
feel I can and so long as I feel it adds value which is kind of dependent upon whatever I'm going to be able to organize in my head as it relates to the works as I consider them and that doesn't happen that doesn't happen on kind of this clockwork basis it's it's tied more to the idea of considering things and having thoughts that I think are interpretations of sort that are worth discussing I don't know again necessarily that any of these things are true but they are possibilities and I, I think if you consider the nature of them um, then you will consider the possibility that these might be influences on Mr. Barrett and perhaps explain some of his behavior and one last thing I will point out really quickly if Mr. Barrett was going through all these difficulties and was attempting to create uh, great works and attempting to capture things within his teeming brain before he might pass, then you could perhaps understand why he would not be overly interested in being really considerate to people that perhaps he had moved on from. Uh, that would be considered, I suppose, a nice thing to do but it also would be a very large waste of time and if he had suffered quite a bit he might also have felt that he was in a state of pain that was beyond what other people were feeling and perhaps they were lesser because uh, they hadn't experienced the same amount of pain that he had or perhaps they were judging him and were treating him poorly and without understanding that he also was suffering which would, I think, deal quite a bit of resentment in a person. I don't know that that's what's going on. I just want to point out that it's a possibility and would also possibly explain why his behavior towards some people might have been considered a little bit mean. So that's uh, pretty much it. And I hope you enjoyed the episode and it was worthwhile. I'll talk to you later.